Hi everyone, it's Natalie and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about the last books I read in January and some of the books that I read in the beginning of February. And once again, I will still be calling this a recent reads video because I don't know what else to call these videos otherwise because they're not really wrap ups, but they also are not really what I've read recently. So, you know, it's just books I've read. <laughs> The first two books I'm going to be talking about are actually two novellas in the same duology, which are Silver in the Wood by Emily Tesh and Drowned Country by Emily Tesh. I will read the summary of the first novella since I have no idea how to explain it myself. There is a wild man who lives in the deep quiet of Green Hollow, and he listens to the wood. Tobias, tethered to the forest, does not dwell on his past life, but he lives a perfectly unremarkable existence with his cottage, his cat, and his dryads. When Hollow Hall acquires a handsome, intensely curious new owner in Henry Silver, everything changes. Old secrets better left buried are dug up and Tobias is forced to reckon with his troubled past both the green magic of the woods and the dark things that rest in its heart. I rated the first novella, Silver and the Wood, three stars. It wasn't my favorite. I read it as an ebook because I bought it on a whim last year. I think at the end of last year is that I bought it. And so I decided to give it a shot and it was just okay. The primary issue I had with it is that the writing style didn't really suit the kind of story this was. For a whimsical, fantastical story about the man of the wood, this had a very cut and dry writing style and it had a very rapid pace. And both of those things made this kind of a strange experience. Strange because I couldn't keep myself from reading. I read this in one night. But at the same time, I was unhappy with the writing style choices made here because I felt like the story could have been so much more if it had been written a bit differently. When I think about what the author chose to do in the sequel, it makes a little bit more sense why this was written the way it was. But because this was written the way it was, I would have appreciated if this had been like 50 pages longer. I would have been able to feel more enmeshed in the story. I would have felt like I understood the world better if this had been slightly longer and if we had spent a little bit more time understanding this world and its characters. But still, I ended up picking up the sequel because I was intrigued enough by the characters and the storyline to want to know what would happen next. And that's how I ended up rating the sequel, Drowned Country, five stars. This novella was actually everything I wanted the first novella to read. And interestingly enough, I listened to this one as an audiobook versus the first one, which I read physically. And I am beginning to think that it might have all been better if I had just listened to the whole thing as an audiobook. But regardless, this had exactly what I was missing from the first one. Primarily because the first book follows more closely Tobias, we have that more curt and precise writing style that's much more dry and much more distant. But here we're following Silver and he is far more emotional, far more upfront, far more big in his personality. And so that really came off on the page and made this a very, very captivating reading experience. And I'm so happy that I picked it up because I really, really, really did enjoy it. Henry slash Silver is the character that for sure made this story. He was a bit selfish, a bit full of himself, but that just made him an incredibly intriguing lead and made him so much more compelling than Tobias. The other thing I enjoyed about the sequel is that it did slow down the pace. The events of the sequel took longer to be described, to be fully lived into. I didn't feel like it was just one thing happening one after the other after the other. It did take more of its time and I really appreciated that because it made me feel more grounded in the story and like I understood better what was going on. Because that's the thing, in the first one I was kind of confused about the sequence of events. Things were happening so fast that I was kind of like, wait, what just happened? What did they just do? I'm, 
I'm confused. Finally, what I enjoyed about the sequel is its discussion on immortality. It really delves into how immortality can change you and how quickly it can make things that matter a lot to mortal humans seem inconsequential and not as important. So I really, really love that whole conversation about how much you can change when you become immortal. So yeah, overall, I would still highly recommend this. I think the sequel makes it so worth it and anything that might feel frustrating in the first one will entirely pay off in the sequel. So because these two books are so short, these two novellas are short, I think there's no harm done in reading both of them. And I would highly recommend picking it up as an audiobook. If audiobooks are your thing, definitely pick them up on that route. I had previously listened to audiobooks by this audiobook narrator. I really, really love that narrator. So that's why I would highly recommend it as an audiobook. The next book I'm going to be talking about is Check Please by Ngozi Okasu. This is the second volume and final volume in this series. In this series, we follow a vlogger who recently starts college and decides to join the hockey team of his school. And so we follow him as he falls in love, comes out, and all that good stuff. I rated this 3.5 stars. It wasn't my favorite, but I also enjoyed a lot of parts of it. I still found myself very emotionally involved in what was going on here. I just felt like one of the primary things that made this a challenging read for me is that I don't like the layout of it. A lot of pages have a lot of text and it just makes this a very overwhelming reading experience. Let me see if I can show you an example. There's so much light that I don't think this can even focus all that well, but honestly, there's just a whole chunk of text. Almost every page is this full of text and that made this a very challenging reading experience. I felt like there was just too much on the page and I felt like the author relied too heavily on the text to carry the story. For graphic novels, for comics, because of its more visual aspect, I expected to rely more on the visuals to tell us the story, to show us what's going on. But instead, the author includes way too much dialogue all the time, and so I was just annoyed and frustrated by it. I also felt like the pacing of this was very inconsistent. It felt like a car jerking forward and backward and forward and backward and forward and backward. It was just very abrupt. There were abrupt time skips. Things happened either very quickly and then suddenly it was over and we were at a different time, either weeks or months later. And it was just strange. The pacing was just a little bit too all over the place for me to fully enjoy this. I definitely feel like this series could have had four volumes so that each year of Betty's life could have been focused on each volume. And I think each volume should have been extended so that we could have felt more deeply enmeshed in Betty's life and not feel like we had to zoom through it so that this wouldn't be an incredibly chunky book because it's already a pretty chunky graphic novel. So I feel like if it had been divided into four and more stuff had been inserted into it, it would have just worked out so much better. The other issue I had is far more personal to me and that is that this has way too many characters. I understand that that's because we're following a hockey team, but honestly, it makes it very overwhelming to me as a reader. I'm not very good at keeping up when we have so many characters. And so even though visually I could distinguish all of them, they did have very unique character designs so that it wasn't hard to tell them apart visually. I could not remember most of their names for the life of me, which made it difficult to keep up with who the hell was who. But yeah, on, again, that's mostly a me thing rather than an actual issue with this, but it still made the reading experience less enjoyable. Ultimately though, the reason I gave this 3.5 stars instead of three stars or something less than that is because I was still emotionally engaged by the story. I came out of the first volume really, really loving Betty and this volume only deepened those feelings. 
I loved exploring how complicated his relationship was, was with his parents, how much he wanted to be out and openly in his relationship with Jack but felt like he couldn't be and was scared of what people would say and do, especially his parents. So Biddy's emotional journey here definitely had me very invested and is one of the primary reasons why I still really really enjoyed this even though there were various elements that made it a more challenging read. I also really grew to appreciate Jack in this volume. He was very sweet, very kind, and very loving and so I loved how supportive he was of Biddy and how much he was in his corner and the way they just made each other feel better and feel supported. I just really really liked their relationship so that's also another element of why I enjoyed this. Overall, still recommend it, still enjoyed it. I just had some minor issues with it. The next book I'm going to be talking about is A Close and Common Orbit by Becky Chambers. As I've mentioned before, I have been rereading this series as part of the Interstellar Book Club that by now the reread, <laughs> the read along is over. But still, in this book, we follow one of the side characters in the first book and essentially it's about an AI struggling with her new life and her new body and it's also about the woman who helps her who had a very difficult childhood being raised in this planet essentially as a slave, as a servant and struggling to leave that planet in order to live a free life. I guess that's the best way I would describe it. I don't know. It's it's Becky Chambers. It's difficult to describe what her books are about because mostly what her books are about are themes. They're not really about plot. And that's actually one of my favorite things about Becky Chambers. I gave this five stars because the characters and the themes Becky Chambers explores are just fantastic. Becky Chambers has this way of making the ordinary feel so entertaining and engaging because you really don't get like big action sequences here even though this is a sci-fi novel. Instead you get really close and personal with characters and in this one in particular, you get even closer with the characters because there's a much smaller cast of characters than in book one. The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet follows, I think, like six characters. And this one mostly just centers on Sidra and on Blue. No, Blue, I think, <laughs> for in my heart, Blue is central, but it's not Blue, it is, what was her name? I his Pepper. It's Pepper. Obviously the first name that pops into my head is Blue because I'm a Blue stan. Blue is the most precious man on to ever exist. To ever exist. He is just so soft, so sweet, so caring. I feel like those are the same words I always use to describe male characters I like, but it's is because there's a common denominator here, okay? I am simple to predict. I see a precious boy and I love him. I mean, Blue is a grown man, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. I'm just talking about soft boy vibes. Soft boy vibes. Blue has them and so I'm weak to them. And so that's just one of the things that is just so fantastic about this book. It really makes you feel committed and essentially in love with these characters and their stories to this point that you just love them wholeheartedly. At least that's how I felt in this book with Pepper because of her very difficult childhood. I was just so heartbroken over everything she had to go through but also so amazed by how she was able to still make a life for herself and how she found happiness and purpose and something that makes her feel, I don't know, but talking about purpose, that's actually one of the major themes of this book. It's about how humans feel this urge to find purpose and how purpose doesn't have to be this grand, amazing thing. Purpose can be small things. Purpose can be 
just what makes you happy and it doesn't have to be what everyone else thinks it should be as long as it's what brings you fulfillment as long as it's what makes you happy and makes you feel like you have a path forward in life then that's all that matters so love that there's also of course the exploration of what does it mean to be human because since we follow an ai sidra who has been recently put in this body kit, which essentially means that she looks like a human, but she wasn't really expecting to be in that body. She is trying to figure out what is she? What is her purpose now that her original purpose has been taken away? And what does it mean to be human in the sense of like, is an AI human? What does it take to be human? Do you have to feel? Is programmed feelings not the same as real feelings? Aren't we all programmed biologically to feel things? If so, if an AI has coding that makes them feel things, how is that any different to our biological coding, our DNA and our whatever making us automatically or more likely to react a certain way or feel a certain way about things that happen to us? So again becky chambers is just brilliant it's just amazing this once again tackles the topic of motherhood but in a different way and in the first book we're mostly engaging in conversations about how motherhood looks different for different people and it doesn't have to follow the same expected structure and this one it's more about who are mothers who do we consider mothers who can become a mother regardless of DNA, regardless of species, regardless of being real or an AI. So again, loved all of that going on here. Becky Chambers is brilliant. I've probably already said that a few times in this video, but there's really no other way to say it. And so yeah, this book ended up being my number one favorite in the series so far. Again, I still haven't read book four as of the moment of filming this video. So I don't know where book four will land in my hierarchy in this series, but so far it's definitely book two, book one, book three, and you know, the mystery of book four. <laughs> so highly, highly recommend this series if you're looking for a soft sci-fi, if you're looking for a sci-fi that is very character driven and that is mostly trying to get you to think. It's not so much trying to transport you into a different world, even though this does have a very intricate world and a very intricate system of planets and species it's not really about sci-fi adventure if that's what you're looking for this is not the series for you but if you're like me and you like character driven stories and you just want to be in space but figuring out how these characters think and how they live their lives then this is the series for you the last book i'm going to be talking about is the voting booth by brandy colbert in this book we follow duke and marva who are trying to get their vote in on voting day marva has been preparing for this day for many many years has very much been looking forward to voting and duke also has been looking forward to this day but he finds himself facing voter suppression. As he tries to get his vote in, challenges keep being put in front of him that keep him from doing that. And so Marva ends up coming in to help him try to successfully vote. I rated this book 4.5 stars. It was fantastic. Once again, Brandy Colbert writes stuff that I just think is perfect for classrooms. In this case, I would think this is the perfect book to talk about voter suppression because it talks about being registered but then suddenly magically not being registered anymore. It talks about being registered at the wrong address so you end up showing up at the wrong place so then you have to find the right place to vote. And then it also talked about running out of ballots because that's something that can happen. And so because this book explores so deeply the challenges especially black people face when voting i think it's an excellent book to use in the classroom to make this a little bit more real for students and so that they can understand the frustration that can come from facing all these challenges and why there can be less black voter turnout it's mostly because it's can be a fucking hassle to vote 
So really, really love that this went into that. Also really loved that both Marva and Duke came from families that were very committed and very interested in voting. I thought that was a really, really nice touch, especially because both of them approach this day very, very differently. Like I mentioned in the summary, Duke was interested in voting, thought it was important, but he wasn't like die hard committed about it. While Marva is definitely die hard committed to it, she would be in her community trying to get other people to vote, preparing other people to vote. So it was just nice to have that contrast. Apart from the voting stuff though, this book is also compelling because of the characters. Duke lost his brother a few years back and is still grieving this loss and is trying to deal with how his father hasn't dealt well with this loss and just how fraught his family is after the loss of this sibling. And he's also trying to deal with his fractured friendship with this girl that they bonded over the fact that both of them had brothers who passed away. And so that in and of itself made this a more compelling story. And on top of that, Duke also had an interest in music. I did a book tag, probably not so recently by the point this video goes up, the Black Parade book tag. And one of my tag questions was perfect for <laughs> this book, but I completely forgot about it. And so I didn't mention it, but one of the questions is mention a character who is a musician. Duke is that, he really loves music. He's very invested in it. And so I really enjoyed that. And Marva, I already talked about most of the things that were engaging about Marva, which is how committed she is to voting and to getting people civically engaged. But what I liked about the contrast between these two characters is that Marva needed to learn to relax while Duke needed to learn to take things more seriously. And so they complemented each other because they pushed each other to do those things that they should have been doing. So it was a great dynamic. So yeah, I feel like I also should note that this is a one day romance. If that's not really your jam, if that's not really your trope, I would still recommend this because of the voter suppression element and topic. But otherwise, I wouldn't expect you to become super invested in the romance since it just transpires over a day. But what I did enjoy about it is that even though they had chemistry and they clearly liked each other and it was a sweet relationship, well, start of a relationship, they also weren't acting like they were super in love and they were everything to each other and none of that stuff was going on. They, it was just the start of a blooming relationship. So yeah, overall would highly, highly, highly recommend this. I'm looking forward to continuing to read more books by Brandy Colbert because the woman is just a brilliant writer. So yeah, that's it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you would like to follow me on any of my social media, I will have the links to that down below in the description. But for now, See you next time.